This program is brought to you by thepodcastfactory.com. Canine crew, it's time to just sell the damn thing. Doberman Dan is revealing his contrarian formula for getting a rush of new customers, building your business faster, and making the highest possible profits. Go to JustSellTheDamnThing.com to get your copy today. Prepare yourself for the uncensored, nothing held back, no BS reality of how business and life really work. Doberman Dan is off the chain. You have no idea what I'm going to talk about today, do you? We just this? you just asked me the title, <laughs> and then you didn't ask anything else. <laughs> I don't. You know what? The thing is that I love to show up unprepared so that you can surprise me. I want to be a fan. I want to be a listener, and I just have the lucky job that I get to talk back. Well, you know, many times life is a lot like jazz. It's best when you improvise. Although, you know, I prepare, but then things happen and things get off track. You got me off track on one episode that I, I'm getting a lot of feedback about. Oh, tell me about that, please. Well, it was, I'm blanking out on what the name of it was, but I'll tell you in just a second. It was the one that I just casually mentioned before. It, it was the economic collapse of America is here. Oh, yeah. That was what it's called. Dude, I'm getting feedback on that, too. Are you really? Yeah. People like loving that episode. Well, it was just supposed to be a. Yeah, I was just going to get into it. But I but prior to that, I like as a caveat, I set it up as, you know, hey, I've, I've been dealing with a crippling bout of depression. So, you know, perhaps my percep perception is skewed. As a result of that, and then I'm about to get into it, and then you derailed me. Well, let's talk about that. <laughs> and so that's the part I'm getting feedback on, not, not so much the rest of it about the economic collapse of America. Well, apparently, I struck a chord with creative people about the depression that many of them deal with. So, you know, hey, whatever. Sometimes it's just good to improvise. Yeah. That's that. You know what? I, I even uh, I got some new clients and they were talking about listening to that show and how uh, that really connected with them. So thank you for that. Well, I'm glad to know that my crippling bout of depression <laughs> has helped others. <laughs> yeah. Keep, hey, I want to give a shout brother. out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm just going to stay in this this black funk because uh, other people get encouragement by that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a shout out to a few people. Unfortunately, I can only this four people specifically. I can only name two by name because two of them did not reveal their names. They called in on the off the chain hotline and the first no name person asked three questions. He wanted to know my thoughts on radio advertising. He wanted to know if I would work for Alex Jones because he felt like, you know, Alex Jones message and his encouragement to entrepreneurs were, were kind of like jived with the stuff I talk about. And then he, his third question was, would I be in a Kenny Loggins tribute band with him? <laughs> so let's, let's say so those three really fast. My thoughts on radio advertising, it rocks, uh, depends on your product and market, but I know a lot of people doing great on radio. I have one client slash friend who in the prepper space was getting 80% to 90% conversion from radio ads. Wow. There are several interesting things he did to get that, but you know, I challenge anybody to do that online and, and, you know, at a average order value, I think of like 80 to a hundred dollars. So radio advertising can definitely rock and look at the numbers. I don't remember off the top of my head, but a lot of people still listen to radio. It is not by any means a dead media. Would I work for Alex Jones? So the answer to that is it depends on how big of a check he wants to write me. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> um, you know, my my interest at this point in life is often dictated by the size of the check. It would have to be six figures or more to to get my interest. But yeah, that might be a fun gig. Would I be in a Kenny Loggins tribute band with him? So 
I am dying for any kind of musical gig because here in Little Ocala, my choices are pretty slim. Like if I don't want to play Leonard Skinner, give me three steps and Mustang Sally every night, which I do not. I did that way too long and I don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> then, yeah, I'm, I'm all up. I'm all uh, I'm definitely up for Kenny Loggins tribute band. Yes. So our second caller was. Nate Rifkin, who's actually Sir Nate of Rifkin because he's one of my knights. And I believe Nate goes back with me to like the very beginning, if not the very first issue of the Doberman Dan Letter. Definitely wow. the first year of I was publishing a Doberman Dan Letter. More information can be found at marketingcamelot.com. Shameless plug, but isn't that what you're supposed to do when you own you, your own media donation? Radio ad, boy. And let me just, before you get into this, we had Nate on the show, right? Yes. So look, I screwed up and Nate sent me a gift after he was on the show, like this cool ski hat because he knows I go snowboarding and I never said thank you. So publicly, I am embarrassed and you can shame me if you want, but I'm publicly saying thank you, Nate. That was very thoughtful. Oh, no, it's that's great. Better late than never. Right. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so Nate just wanted to give us a shout out. Uh, what he said is he liked my battle cry to entrepreneurs and awake people to keep our minds and spirits free from the oppressors. And I think he was specifically talking about the you're being led to slaughter podcast episode 177. I think that's the one he was talking about. So the next shout out I will give is to another person who did not share their name when they called in on the off the chain hotline, which was, yeah. <laughs> we'll see if you're more prepared than I am, which that number, if you would want to call and share your thoughts is Jonathan. Well, uh, Come back in just a second when I look it up, but uh, go ahead with that and I'll have it. <laughs> you got me. The only reason I'm only reason I'm throwing you under the bus is because I was unprepared and did not have that handy. So uh, this gentleman said he thinks I should play the guitar more, and he specifically requested some Metallica. Yeah. So there we go. I'll keep that in mind. I'm um, not a person who likes doing solo acts so dan i like when there's another band you know other band members that i can hide behind if i make mistakes i yeah we just saw a little example of that so the hotline number is 321-424-6043 that's 321-424-6043 there you go and and i and i will say i probably should have put this on the greeting that people get i think you only have like 30 seconds on that message because you know hey we're just cheap bastards and we went with the cheap <laughs> five dollar a month voicemail so you don't have unlimited recording times so you'll have to give us your quick thoughts the other person i'll give a shout out to is eric bakey from austin texas who actually sent me a real letter a real letter is a letter as god intended a letter to be sent in on paper and ink Whoa. so he says dan your podcast is awesome, especially the one you just published on You're Being Led to Slaughter. It's no surprise that 2% of the American people control uh, most of the wealth in this nation, and they're jerking the strings while the rest of us are dancing to it. We've mm. been brainwashed from the time we were born into believing we don't have a chance. The challenge is to take back your mind. I'm a combat vetrepreneur, cartoonist, and copywriter. Keep up the good fight. On the front of capitalism, I'd share a foxhole with you any day to higher response, Eric Bakey, which was really nice. And he also, he's a cartoonist, so he did me uh, a nice little sheep cartoon on the back of the letter. Yes. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate, since he took, invested the time to send a real letter, I invested the time to uh, reply back to him via a real letter. Nice. Yes, us old school guys still do that. So that was... Not a brief shout out was it? it was like 10 minutes of shouting out. Yeah, but I want to point something out to you so that you're fully aware of this because I think you're too close to see it. But all the feedback you got was not on your interviews, but on your solo shows. When when you do them solo shows and you talk about the weird shit, we love it, brother. Well, I find that interesting. It's, <laughs> people like to wind me up 
and watch me spin, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I just listened to the episode we did about GDPR, the compliance stuff from Europe. Yeah. And uh, I was pretty wound up on that one. I, oh, yeah. I, I told myself I would refrain from dropping the F-bomb simply because, like, I don't want to alienate younger listeners. When I say younger, I mean minors under 18. And if their parents, which I find amusing, I mean, they hear way worse than that at school. But if their parents don't want them exposed to that kind of language, but yet want to expose them to the message, you know, after a conversation I had with somebody, a mother I had at a conversation I had was a podcast fan, but she said she wouldn't let her kids listen to Ooh. many of my episodes because <laughs> <laughs> when I got fired up, I dropped the F-bomb. So I've specifically been uh, re restraining myself on that, but I guess I just couldn't control it on the GDPR episode. I dropped several F-bombs on that, which I think, you know, righteous anger. I was justified. Yeah. But yeah, well, good. I'm, I'm glad people enjoy the episodes where... I wind myself up and and let myself, you know, go off, which I guess this might qualify as one. Another self-deprecating message, which probably doesn't necessarily serve me because I've been doing that my entire life, probably because I've been programmed to do that my entire life. But but hey, if it serves you, then you, whatever. My crippling depression <laughs> sitting in my bedroom with a Glock 19 in my mouth trying to figure out at least one reason not to pull the trigger and all my self-deprecation. Hey, if that just serves you, then whatever, let's go with it. So <laughs> nice. I'm entitling this one, Stupid Marketing Mistakes I've Made, Part 1 of 1001. And maybe probably 1001 is probably really conservative. Maybe it should be close to 10,000 in one because I just I've screwed up everything in the past. In regards to business, in my personal life and everything, uh, and continue to just make plenty of mistakes, which, you know, if you think about it, the fact that I probably have you beat on the amount of mistakes that I've made might just be the thing that's holding you back from everything you want in life. But but that's a topic for another time. So so stupid marketing mistakes I've made. You know what? I find it really amusing when these copywriters, the freelance copywriters for hire, hired gun copywriters brag about their alleged successes on their websites. Have, have you ever read some of that stuff, the, all the chest beating that the, the, the now legion of copywriters online are doing? Bro, that's all Facebook is now. I mean, at least with my network. I, I love it. You know, my, my initial thought is rookie. This guy's a clueless rookie. But f ironically, I don't see that much from the women copywriters. You know, women are so much smarter than us men. The problem is nobody told us guys that. <laughs> but I, I, I'm amused by all the chest beating. Like one recently, one copywriter was bragging about a 46 percent response rate he allegedly got from a lead gen piece he wrote for a client. You know, and I thought if if I were a social media troll, you know, I could I could respond back. Oh yeah, measly 46 percent. That ain't nothing, honey obscure 80s commercial reference. I got a 100% response on a lead gen piece I wrote several years ago. I mean, yeah, 100% response, but one letter to one so, person. Yeah. Well, you see, <laughs> when you leave out some of the facts, it sounds so much sexier. Like, so yeah. So it was, yeah, it was sent, actually sent to two people, 100% response. But when it was all said and done, take a Take a quick stab at how much cashola I uh, made from that 100% response. Go ahead. Take a wild guess. 100,000. Um, well, you're close. So if we subtract 100,000 from that number, we get the actual <laughs> number. So, so how impressed are you now with my 100% response? <laughs> I feel a little bit less impressed now, Dan. That's, as was I in my most humble but accurate opinion. Response rates don't mean jack. I mean, neither does. I love how people brag about that. It doesn't mean anything. Neither does how much traffic you're getting to your website, how many mooches you've signed up on your freebie seeker email list. Any of that dumb stuff rookie marketers brag about. The only metrics that really matter to to moi 
uh, is the ROI on your marketing dollars and how much cashola are you making from the business for your greedy little self? How much cash are you taking off the table for yourself? Because, I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. So, so bragging about response rates, I think it's kind of stupid. So, here, you know, here I was back in the day, 100% response rate and going broke. And I know marketers getting like a 0.28% response rate, not 28, 0.28% response rate and getting, getting just filthy, stinking rich. So, so I, you know, I say, let the clueless rookies brag about the response rates. That doesn't, doesn't impress the true players. The, the other thing I've noticed about the, the, the now legion, the plethora of copywriters coming out of the woodwork online nowadays, they never talk about their failures. They just lead you to believe like they've never had any. And I'm the first to let you know, I've, I've been doing that since day one, since I started publishing information for, for entrepreneurs on this podcast that, you know, I readily admit and I'm happy to admit I've picked a whole big old frickin crop of whoopsie daisies during my entrepreneurial journey in my short journey, which I've now ended uh, as a freelance copywriter. And I'm proud of my failures because when you're swinging for the fences, you're going to strike out most of the time. That is just how the numbers work out. You want to break world records for home runs, you're going to break world records for strikeouts too. I have lost millions of dollars, literally, of my own money. I didn't, until I was already successful, I never accepted a client job. I never tested my abilities with somebody else's money. I only tested my marketing copyright abilities with my own money. Very few copywriters can claim that. Yeah. And I have lost millions of dollars of my own money, making a bunch of mistakes with my own businesses, putting my own money where my mouth and pen is. But I, you know, I say losing money. I don't look at it. Well, yeah, back then I did. But now <laughs> I don't look at it like I lost money. I do not look at that as failure. I consider it a multi million dollar investment in my marketing education. So, so y y you know, and that can never be taken from me. All my material possessions can be taken from me in a New York minute by the stroke of a pen. And it happens daily in this country, in this world nowadays. But what I've invested multi-millions of dollars in that's inside my cranium and corazón cannot be taken from me. So yeah, I am not the least bit embarrassed to share my mistakes. I've learned way more from those than the successes. So uh, I will share one that was a, a, a doozy for me back in the day when I was still a rookie. Just to, you know, again, more self-deprecation to make you feel better <laughs> about <laughs> yourself. I hit my, 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 the first home run I hit, okay, was was with direct response marketing in a mail order business. This was prior to the internet even being a viable medium. You know, prior to that was nine years of serial entrepreneurial failure. But the the first successful business I had turned into, I had a home run hit. So I just thought I could do no wrong, which is a typical arrogant rookie mistake. So I'd written a full page magazine ad that was kicking complete boote in Every single magazine I ran it in. This was in the bodybuilding niche back when I was in that market. And so this ad was bringing in anywhere from three times to five times ad cost on every insertion, which that lasted for what well, was over two years. I think in some wow. magazines, almost three years. I mean, <laughs> there's no way to duplicate that online anymore. I mean, you know, get a Facebook ad to last three days. Hallelujah. It's time to, <laughs> you know do a pew jumping, hallelujah, snake shaking, tongue talking, Bible thumping breakdown. Uh, but, you know, back then we didn't have the internet and life was so much better. But <laughs> so, so anyway, you know, spent 3000 on an ad and worst case scenario brings in 9,000. Now 
One thing about this, this was another huge mistake, but I won't go into it. I thought that was normal. I thought, oh, this is great. I'm making a profit on the front end. That that cost me tens of millions of dollars. But so and anyway, I, I thought I was going to go into more about that, but I'll I'll save that for another time. So this ad was so successful, I started started rolling it out in every media I had available at that time. And the ad reps from Penthouse Magazine saw my ad running and all these bodybuilding magazines and fitness magazines. So they start courting me for my business. And they showed all kinds of circulation statistics showing, you know, like how many of the readers had a strong interest in fitness and were supplement buyers and other supplement companies were running ads and yada, yada, yada. And we have this, here's our audited circulation. And, you know, we estimate pass along circulation, you know, whatever they estimated that at like three times their audited circulation, five times. I, you know, don't ask me how they come up with those pass along numbers. Frankly, they just invent them out of thin air. That's well, right. you know, so we've got, uh, you know, we've got 150,000 paid subscribers, but we estimate every subscriber passes each monthly issue on to 47 people, you know, so now we've got two hot, we, we got more than the population of the entire country <laughs> as readers of this man. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So anyway, I believed these guys. I didn't, I mean, by the way, if anybody does any space ads in magazines, when they send you their media kit and their rate card, that that's sucker rate. Nobody pays that. And just throw out their, their, their media kit because it's all bullshit. They just make up all that stuff. There's no way to verify it. <laughs> but I believed them. And, uh, you know, so back then, a full page ad in Penthouse was like 45, 45,000, 50,000. I don't remember off the top of my head. Wow. Um, so, so let's put that, let's say it was 45,000. Let, let's put that very conservatively into today's dollars thanks to what the banking cartel has done to our money Let, let's say that's like about ninety thousand dollars in today's dollars so so I, I i did the best negotiation job i could i just couldn't get the rep down very high so what i got them to agree to was net 30-day terms which means i didn't have to pay for the ad after 30 days so I was so successful with this ad in every other magazine. I just assumed it was a given. I get at least, you know, what I was getting in some of the worst performing bodybuilding magazines. I get at least three times the ad cost, maybe more. So, you know, so the minor little detail that I didn't have their 50 grand for the ad <laughs> that I didn't have to pay for for 30 days, you know, like, oh, let's not worry about that. You know, and I was, hey, I was successful. I was, you know, in my mind, just an awesome copywriter with those kinds of results. So. But, you know, it seems like every time I start thinking I can do no wrong, something humbles me. These days, I, I rarely and practically I can say never think that because I know better. But back then, you know, I thought oh, I can do no wrong. I'm, I know this marketing stuff, but something always humbled me. So I had been, you know, rolling out so quickly in, in all these different ads that everything cash flow was just being plowed back into the business. So I was taking very little net out for myself. So, but I'm thinking no problem, you know, whatever, 50 grand for this ad, three X ad, I was probably going to bring in worst case scenario, 150 grand. I'll pay the ad off in 30 days, you know, have a hundred grand left over. It hit me like a ton of bricks when that ad only grossed like 4,000 and change. And, Whoa. and I was on the hook to penthouse for 50 grand in 30 days. So, so I, I used my negotiation skills, which really back then were, were nothing more than pleading and begging to work out a payment plan on the balance I owed them. And yeah. I felt like such a complete schmuck at that point. Yeah, it was, by the way, my friend, Dr. Glenn Livingston, who's been on the show, told me that in Hebrew, schmuck means useless penis. So if that is the true <laughs> meaning of that word, that is an accurate description of exactly how I felt. So now I, maybe to you, dear listener, the lesson here seems quite obvious, but back in my rookie days, I'd never thought about it before this penthouse incident, as I call it now. So, so what's the lesson you ask? Well, I'm happy to tell you, no matter how successful your copy is, no matter how many different media you're, you've run successfully in, Drum roll, please. Every 
insertion in a new media, new medium is a new test. Just because your ad, your copy is kicking bootay in one channel, in one medium, doesn't mean it's going to do well in another. Just because your ad is doing great, you you know, on Facebook doesn't mean it's going to do great on Google AdWords. Just because your copy is working great online doesn't mean it's going to do well in an offline media and and vice versa. You dig? So my ad was pulling three to five times ad costs in about like six or seven magazines. So I was sure it would be a grand slam home run in penthouse, even if it in the worst case scenario. You know, and with that massive circulation, they deceived me into believing with pass along circulation. I was already counting up the money in my head and the Ferrari I'd buy. Seriously, that was my thought process. But alas, as it turned out, there was no winner, winner, chicken dinner for rookie Doberman Dan. So I, I just I didn't at that time, I really didn't believe I was taking a big risk. I just ass oomed. My past success with that ad in other media guaranteed success in penthouse too. But, you know, it basically what I did, I rolled the dice with money I didn't have. That was not the first time I did that. And that rolling the dice with money I didn't have, assuming or feeling something was going to be success. Those are some of the biggest reasons why I've gone legally bankrupt once and technically bankrupt for additional time. So, and by by the way, as a side note, I mean, just think about it. I mean, I can look back in hindsight now. Do you really think horny guys are buying penthouse to look at supplement ads and buy supplements? Uh, Yeah, Dan, I think they're actually looking at those magazines to work out their forearms. So, yeah. With that's true. (laughs) (laughs) This and now this example totally dazed me because like some people are saying like, why would anybody spend money on a penthouse magazine? Yeah. Porn online is free. <laughs> well, it's a different world back then. So listen, I guess one of my main points is I made my point about, you know, every new channel or new medium is a new test, but you'll learn so much more from your failures than your successes. So don't be afraid of failure because for every failure, let's reframe that. Don't be afraid of getting results that you didn't expect because negative feedback. Exactly. It's negative feedback. When you get results like that, it's feedback is what it is. And it just puts you that much closer to success as cliche and hackneyed as this sounds, but it's true. It it gets you that much closer to success because you know what not to do. Do you think I've done that again with any new test I've ever done? No. Every time I'm vetting a new media or a new channel or a new test, I'm always reminded of my penthouse incident. So, so don't look at these things as failure. It's just getting you closer to success. And, and trust me, trust your good old uncle DD. Just one success can make up for all the failures a thousand fold. Boom. So Dan, dare I ask if you have a sneak preview for next time? Uh, yeah. Although the title might change, (laughs) the title might change, but at the time of publishing, but um, at this point, the title of our next episode is The Artist's Journey is the Hero's Journey. All right. So another Off the Chain show is in the can. We will be back in your earbuds next time, K9 Crew. Thanks for tuning in. K9 Crew, before you run off, I want to remind you, Doberman Dan has set up an Off the Chain hotline call in tell us you love us it's even better if you tell us you hate us it doesn't matter what you say all you have to do is call in leave a message the number is 321-424-6043 again off the chain hotline 321-424-6043